for the month of February, a beautiful day today. Um, have some big issues coming our way. Uh, we have Mike the Avenue with former president of the LCPA, Louisiana Crawfish Producers Association West, avid fisherman and guy that really knows the Chapelai Basin. Before we go into Mike's issues, uh, just a couple of things. Uh, tomorrow in New Orleans at 10 o'clock at the New Orleans District Office, there's a meeting uh, with the Corps of Engineers about the impending flood threat coming our way. We have a very high Mississippi River and a shelf line that's going to get higher and probably challenge the system. Um, it's going to be lots of water and probably lots of crawfish, huh, Mike? Big water year is good for crawfish. Lead on. We're going to have some when it's time. And just a brief report on our... Uh, we had Wednesday, last past Wednesday night on the 20th a public hearing on the flood issue in Acadiana. The test for the system and had a little, little over 100 people in attendance. And um, an excellent opportunity to, to share uh, what has been done, what hasn't been done, what needs to be done in terms of lowering flood stages in the test for million system. Um, essentially, when the, before the levees were built in 1930s, early 30s, and up to 35, uh, all the water from Alexandria down went into the Chapelle or the Red River. Uh, we built a big levee system that that water can't go into the basin anymore. Very small gates. Uh, many of the gates have been closed for one reason or another. And then they built the Red River system, uh, a, made it a navigable bargeway all the way to Shreveport. That meant locking dams all the way up the river uh, that prevented Rapides Parish, including the whole city of Alexandria, from draining into the Red River. Now all that water comes down to us in the Vermilion and the Bayatesh. So big changes were made more and more water coming and less and less place to put it. Uh, we have a small gate system at Catabla. It's only 500 square feet and can, it's very dependent on how high the water is in the basin. Right now the water is very high, so if we had a big rain event, we couldn't drain into the basin very well. Uh, we have a dam at Henderson that essentially makes uh, the Henderson Swamp, where that water should go, an impoundment. It's blocked by a dam. And, and if it goes down to buy a test, it's the same thing. It's an impoundment. It's blocked by a lock and dam. All these features were put in to help navigation. It wasn't to deal with a flood. Uh, for the Henderson Gate, it was built in the uh, late 60s, so the tugs and barges put in Interstate 10 together could go into that swamp in the low water period of the year. Uh, it should have been taken out when we finish I-10, uh, but it's still there and causing higher levels in the Tesh Vermilion, which flooded a lot of homes. So, uh, But the meeting was to share what we've learned, what has been done, um, and uh, what needs to be done, like dredge the Vermilion by if that needs to be done. So, Because uh, it's filled in. Today it's about a foot deep. Uh, the water's low, and the north wind's blowing, and it's getting lower. So anyway, come to Mike. Mike, uh, we met, I guess, 20 years or so ago, fighting legal issues. So Mike, what was, the sheriff was ready to kick you all out of the swamps, right, at that time? Yeah. So, and you put a band of about 500 crawfishmen together, and both on the east and west side, and all up and down from, I guess, from Arnaville to Franklin. And so successfully held that organization together and dealt with many cases, litigation, involving the rights of people to use public waters. So Mike, kind of share us with us your history with Louisiana Crawfish Producers Association and your history in fishing the basin. Well, I've been fishing for like 40 years, Mr. Howard. I can't hardly do it no more. But... um. We've seen so many changes over the years, you know. The, uh, all the bodies have been blocked. All the... Uh, Natural the waterways have been blocked. The swamps have been blocked. 
Yeah, the the, the uh, lake's all been filled in, and uh, the uh, everybody's fishing with the same three now. You know, you, you, when you hit a, a, a spot where it's good, everybody everybody goes to that spot. So as the water quality deteriorated, uh, y'all had to adopt your fishing methods and locations. So more and more fishermen getting into the fewer and fewer places that had uh, ability to produce crawfish, right? And then the, actually there's a physical condemnation of large areas where you couldn't get a boat into the swamp at all because of big spoil banks and dams left behind. Is that right? Yeah. And it got to, the, the area was always so productive, Mr. Howard, you know, we always had another place to go. It got to the point now where you don't have nowhere else to go, you know, and the, uh, it, it, it's an easy solution, I think, to fix it, you know, reopen those natural bodies and clean out the cuts, those cuts they have in those pipeline spall banks. And we've been working with some people uh, with the parish and the state they want to uh, try to get some small projects together and do, and do a small project, open up a bayou, clean out some cuts, and then we have uh, some money that's coming in maybe from the, uh, the coastal restoration thing. The Martin Parish is eligible for some of that money. And then even the pipeline people are willing to put up money to do maintenance work on their pipelines. Look, when they first built the pipelines, they, had, they made the cuts, all the bodies were open. It worked for 40 years, but it never was maintained. So if you go out there and clean those cuts and open those bodies, guess what? Maybe it's it might work. work for another yeah. 40 years. You know? And the natural body is a whole ecosystem onto itself. It, it moves water in and out of the swamp. It has natural banks where the water flows over and through the soil, so to speak. Uh, it's a system that is connected by coolies and smaller ditches and, and it's a whole maze of interconnections into the swamp, into ponds and so forth that doesn't exist on a canal. And one of the most important things, the bayou has a gradient, I mean it's sloped down, so when water comes into it, it's going to move through it and, and it's going to flow during the flood, it's going to flow during the water, low water periods when the swamp is a tidal area. And that up and down motion of the tide is very important for the vegetation and all the fish that's out there. Uh, it's important for water quality. And in, in the bayou, when the water moves through the bayou as it goes around the curve, the oxygen-rich surface water circulates to the bottom where the clams and the snails and the worms and the grubs and the mollusks, all those critters live, that begins the food chain of life. And so you get a whole natural system that is restored when you bring the bayou back into the ecosystem. And, and it's something you all have witnessed as fishermen. That's where you're gonna, you're not gonna catch fish, you're not gonna get crawfish in a canal. You'll catch it where the bayou is open and the swamp is functioning. Well, it's not just about the bayous, you know. I mean, uh, the crawfish, you know, the sport, the uh, the fish. It, it's it's a estuary, you know. The fish want to try to get in there and, and spawn, yeah. and they can't. And it's yeah, just as important. Closed. You know, it's just as important for the for the bayou to flow during low water as it is in high water, because you wouldn't imagine when you have a, a rain event how much sediment is moved, you know, further down out of these areas. Yeah. And go down there where it's supposed to be, you know, towards the coast down there. Right. Because yeah. the lower part of the basin is sinking, you know, yeah. because no Over sediment Over the east down side, there. there's no sediment going, going down there, and the numbers are astonishing. Uh, the east side, I guess, from Bayou Sorrel to Morgan City uh, is sinking at 48 plus millimeters a year. Now, uh, that means, you know, 40 years down the road, the place has sunk eight or nine feet. And, and that's happening. You can see uh, in the swamps there, often you're losing all the trees. The trees are dying right and left because it's getting too deep to support trees. It's going to be similar to, to, to lead a bend. 
And the only way the air gets watered is by backwatering, backflow, and backflow doesn't carry sediment at all. And yeah, that, that's your biggest problem. Every one of our swamps we fill up from the bottom. Bobai, Kokodri, Buffalo, Buffalo Cove. Cove. All these areas fill up. And what and we're trying to do is get the bodies open at the top to so where the through. water's coming in at about five feet at Butler Rose. Before, it, before the, the swamp fills up, you got a current going down. Yeah, if so you the, uh, the pipelines are the pipelines are actually like weirs now. By the time the water passes over at about twelve feet at Butler Rose, your current's already going down. So that current it, it's gonna take that, that, that current is and it's gonna go down. That's how it used to work. But it don't work like that no more. Because the top of those bodies are all blocked. So the and it water take a lot to open them things up, right. I'm telling you. So the water has to come from the bottom and, and that's the high point is going up the river system and away from the center. The main channel is the high point. So if you open it up to the main channel, that's a natural bite, it's gonna flow south and to the sides where you want it to go. You'll get that flow through. And they had an opening that I guess accidentally happened over there in Buffalo Cove and fishing got real good and you could notice a continuous current and I guess somebody in Baton Rouge found out that this thing was open and they immediately, you know, got contractors to go out there and close it. Uh, very much to the detriment of water quality and fishing. Well, every, everything we always told them, suggested them what to do, we met over the years, they always did the opposite of what they wanted to do. They're still making east-west cuts off the channel. And they, those things sand up in 15 minutes. Uh, they made some cuts at the top of Bobai this year. That's all. How they're doing? There's a lot of commotion about the, uh, I guess, Bike Bridge Pipeline, which is, I guess, third or fourth they put in the last year and a half. And uh, you know, they didn't. Nobody raised hell about the other three. Those guys did a good job. Yeah, yeah. From what I saw, they did a good job, and they, they're still trying to stop them, and the pipes in the ground. You know. Yeah, that I, I don't understand. Uh, I think the, they they operate in that line now, almost uh, very close to being there. So, you know, we talked to so, some of those pipeline people, and and they're willing to put up money to do maintenance work. You know, on on some of these areas, they don't know better. Those guys don't know. You know, they they just go out there, they put in their pipeline, and they ask, you know, what y'all want us to do, and they try to do the best that they can. But um. Uh, you can't get in there and argue with them, you know, Mr. Howe. I learned my lesson with that. Yeah. You, you can't uh, sue them to keep you in court for 15 years, and you don't get nothing out of it. No, no, you, you don't you you get off, positive. Better off working with them. That's and right. I think, you know, they're already doing a lot better. They, you know, uh, horizontal drilling under the river, under the levees, you know, so they're not doing that. They could probably horizontal drill the whole way across the basin and the time will come when they will, you know, when they're, they're 300 feet below and that's probably the best thing to do. And I don't know what the ex extra expense is, maybe not that much. Uh, but, but I know they have, they're have. going to have a lot less labor to do that. But Yeah, and there's no maintenance issue, and there's no cutting of trees, anything like that, you know, so. Um, you know, they, they're required to have a 50-foot cut every 500 feet. And the original cuts are there. And all it would take is to go out there with some small equipment, clean out those cuts, and open up those natural bodies. And you get water flowing in them swamps at 12 feet at Butler Rose. Because that high water's not good. That right. high water's not good with all that sediment, I'm, I'm telling you. And what, you gotta, what uh, do you see as far as, you know, what are the biggest issues for you all is finding good water quality and and that's a real tough thing to do, isn't it? The only time you see a north south flow in the basin is when the river goes on a stand and it starts to fall. Yeah. Unless yeah. the water gets real, real high where it, you have a north south flow. But you you're gonna see a foot of sand in a place where, you know, where it wasn't like that a year ago. I see the river's supposed to go to 19, uh, it's at 16 now, so you got a three-foot rise coming in the next, what, till the 2nd or 3rd of March, 
Mardi Gras? That's what they claim, but uh, they like to keep that river. It's at about 17 right now, <clears throat> and uh, everything's flooded. Everything's underwater. So if it goes to 19, all your land is going to be off the water, or uh, the water and underwater. And you have to uh, land straight off the levee. You, got, you, you want them to use the boat landing. You need, you need a four-wheel drive to, uh, to land your boat. And it don't take much to restore a system, you know, Mr. Howe? No, it, it doesn't. I mean, you know, the fish come back like that, the, the frogs that, that, come back that, like that. That's one of the things that, that we very, it, you know, it takes six to eight weeks to grow a crawfish crop. It takes 90 days to grow a shrimp crop. You grow frogs in a year, bass and brim in a year. So the system, when you store water quality, there's almost overnight response to more wildlife, and it, and it also affects ducks, it affects, you know, everything out there, the herons, egrets, all the birds. If the, you know, the ecosystem improves, you're gonna have food for the egrets and herons and otters and you name it, the whole system just, you know, takes off and you can go into Lake Boss Point, it's in better health than the other side. Oh yeah, that's where all the fish at, on this side of the levee. Yeah. Cause you got, it's, it's like a natural system on this side. And, yeah, and you don't have it all covered with canals, they don't build the swamps and it's still very much connected to the bay and you got crabs in it, you got mud, you got flounder, you got all kinds of fish in there, you know. And you know all that water ends up in the Vermilion Bay that helps the, the shrimp, that helps everything, you know? Every time, every year when we had high water, we always caught a lot of shrimp. Oh right yeah. In the bay. You can and look you at see, see shrimp production and, and high water. And you have a high water year, the next year you have a real high shrimp production. And that's true for a hundred years. We've, we've monitored that, you know, when you get these big high water events, it's very beneficial to the whole area. To, the shrimping and the crabbing and the whole system. Well, I'm not bad mouthing pipeline companies anymore. I'm trying to get them to uh, help, you know, compromise the style, you know. I think the the willingness there on their part, you know, to, you know, the pipeline companies of today are not responsible for the sins of 40, 50, 60 years ago. But I think today they're willing to uh, make some corrections. Well, they and have a black eye right now. Yeah. So anything that they would do to help is, is going to be good public relation for them, you know? Yeah, and very and beneficial. they got more money than, than God, you know? Yeah. They'd yeah. rather put up $20 million to yeah. fix something than to give you a million dollars if you sue them. Right, you and, and the, the, you know, the original pipelines were all the chemical companies and the oil companies. Now the pipeline companies are kind of independent transportation people, you know. So I think there's a willingness on their part to do a better job, stay out of legal trouble with the public and all that. And you get people, there's economic interests opposing these pipelines that are tied to the rail companies. They don't want the, the oil to be shipped by pipelines, they want it to be shipped by rail. And, and you know, they're making big contributions and financing opponents. And a lot of people that were sleeping in tents and everything in the woods around the pipeline and the basin are financed by big money interests that uh, rather have the oil moved by train than by uh, pipeline. The, the risk in, in, in moving oil by rail is like 85 times more than the risk of moving by pipeline. And the pipelines have had a few problems, they, and that's just the nature of things, you know, but um, the trains have had a lot more. Well, I think it's better to try to work with them and get whatever you think, whatever they're willing to give you, than to, uh, to, f than to fight them because you're not gonna beat them. I learned that. Well, they, they you know, you can't stop right, them. they have eminent domain, you can't stop which means they could go your, across your property just like a public road. You know, the legal, the you know, the railroads fought them, fought them, until you know, the pipeline went to the Congress and got the right of you know, eminent domain, the right to take your private property to build their lines. And 
it's all over with that. You know, they have the same right as uh, a city needing your lot to, to build a street. And you need them. You have to have them. Well, we have you know? to have them. There's no question about that. You know, so. it's part of our economy. Look, I fought them people for 15 years, and I learned my lesson. Uh, y'all got in a big fight with, I guess, big landowners wanted to kick y'all out of the basin. Is that correct? And they were hooked up with the sheriff and every, you know, and the DA's office, and you name it. Yeah, well, that was years ago. They, they don't mess with us about that no more. No, no. Because yeah. uh, ultimately, the right, you have a right to use the waters, whether it's a bayou or a swamp or up to the ordinary high water mark. And, and you know when they built the levees, what it was, uh, they paid about a thousand acres maybe of easement when they built the levees? Yeah. So now they got like 500,000 acres that's being claimed. So what happened, you know? Yeah. It, w it, it was stolen. And the state don't want to come after their resources. But that, that never was our battle. No. Our battle was access, public yeah. access. Yeah, the, yo, never and, involved. And, and we won and that battle. You know, we're gonna go. Yeah. If I if I see a water line on a tree, that's my boundary. That's right. That's where I can go. Yeah. And a lot of people don't understand that. And if you don't know better, and they tell you, well, you you don't have a right to be here, you're gonna leave. Yeah. That's why you have to educate yourself as to what your rights are. You know, Mister Howard, they don't teach civics in school anymore. They don't yeah. te teach ge uh, geography, and they don't teach uh, nothing anymore in school. Certainly the kid, not economic. the kids don't even know who the vice president is or <laughs> who the, uh, the, the uh, lieutenant governor is and they don't know how, to, how a law or a bill is passed. And they have three type of people, Mr. Al. They have something that watch what's going on. They, hunt, they have something that do, do something and they have something that wonder what's going on. That's the three type right there. You got it. You got it. And, and you know, where, where do you put most of the politicians? They're the guys that are watching or wondering what happened. Right. You know, we had this big meeting Wednesday night. You got the governor's office is there. Acadiana Planning is there. Uh, Congressman Higgins had two of his staff there. The, um, uh, we had uh, the Bayou-Bambillion District. The test a million people were there. Uh, test the mid freshwater district, all these people coming to share what they know about this flood and how we can manage it better. And we had one public official, uh, a police juryman from Vermillion Parish was the only public official. Now we had people, your parish president committed to be a speaker. He didn't show up. You had, go down the list, uh, we had uh, Lafayette Consolidated Government, you know, had a had a commitment to be present, and they didn't make it, and 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 so you wonder just how you know concerned people are about this whole issue of flooding and water management. And, well, you know, you we we right now we know that um, when they built the big Red River system, we could let water in from Alexandria that would keep, you know, do as much as test for me would be a big addition to test for me. We need test for me. Well, the, the thing with the test for million, when they did that, that's what sanded up the vermilion, it sanded up the body test, and it sanded up Catahoula Lake. Yep, absolutely. All it did was sand everything up. Yep. yep. What they would need to do is uh, quit passing that muddy water in, in those areas. We, the water never gets clear in Catahoula Lake anymore. And it used to have 80 feet of water in that lake. They must be catching fish up up the by your army. Yeah. We passed by they're the land the other day. There's 15 boats. 15 they're catching, in, uh, they're catching in Catahoula Lake. They're catching in Falls Point. In Sack Lake. They're catching it, yeah. Lake Martin. They're catching. I knew they were catching Lake Martin. But now this is the time. But put in Lake Falls Point. They're catching. Yeah. This I saw that today. They were catching. And then you got to fish right against the bank in about this much water. Those oh. fish are trying to spawn, I guess. They're going into the warm up where the water's the warmest. So you fish only about eggs. a foot deep right next to the bank, right? Yeah, and they're trying to lay their eggs. Yeah, yeah, February. And spawning, pretty pretty time of the year. I got a neighbor of mine that's how he fished them every, every, every year at this time. He told me, he said, you fish that in about six inches of water, 
right against the bank. He said the fish have to be sideways because they're so big. If no they be this way, they be sticking out the water. Wow. And some big giant sucker that is every year at about this time is when they catch them. But they're catching them right now. Wow. They had about 15 boats that they landed on yesterday in Catahoula. In Catahoula? Yeah. That only means so one thing, they catch it fish. Catching. Yeah, yeah. they're bound to be catching fish. Now, do they catch going up or they catch going down or both? Oh, I'm not sure where they're fishing. You're not watching them? No. Right. I get a rabbit on them. More of sackle is good, good eating, right? Right. Oh, yeah. That's the best. And y'all were involved in uh, many legal cases, and I guess the one that really got your attention was originally the Barra case, and the Barra cousins, they were arrested for trespassing, and it must have been um, down near the the, uh, uh, the area between the Butte La Rose Gauge and the levee, in that area, right at Ruiz Landing. And that's more up a pipeline and all in that area. Yeah. And um, and then that went to the Court of Appeals and all, and they lost all the way. And I, they were making the argument that they made under the wrong argument. They made the wrong argument. They made they made the argument that under state law, you can go to the bank and fish. I mean, go to the bank and 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 tie up and make repairs and mend your nets and so forth, which didn't have a lot to do with crawfishing. They made the wrong argument. But then, not long after the Barra case, the Larry Dago case came up, and that's in St. Martin Parish, and Judge, judge Connery was a judge in that case, and that was five days of trial, and five complete days of trial. The judge went to the area, and by a mystic crew, um, we had the president of the American Maritime Administration, who was the key witness in the Exxon Valdez case, he volunteered and came and spent with his crew of engineers and uh, surveyors, went to the Mystic Cruise site, spent three days there, and he was on a witness stand a day and a half, and uh, he was there in behalf of the Gulf fishermen and didn't charge anybody a nickel. And uh, the attorneys fighting this were all from New Orleans and they weren't charging anybody. So, but it ended up that the seven charges against Larry Daigle for criminal trespass uh, were all found to be, he was found to be not guilty of all seven charges. And nobody and even knew about what was going on. Right. You know? it, it's, it and, and amazingly, um, the uh, the judge declared the area waters of the nation, and the Corps was trying to buy it. And when that decision came out, they couldn't buy it, and it cost the property owners. Uh, they were selling thirty thousand acres for fifteen hundred dollars an acre, so that was forty five million dollars is what the claimants of the property didn't get over this Larry Daigle case. And it was just an amazing case, and it's, you know, we live in a great country to see that, you know, a poor fisherman, you know, who is being beat up on by the district attorney's office and by the courts. And then the first offense was a uh, $500 fine and six months in jail. So what do you do with seven charges? He would probably still be in jail. Uh, he could have gone to the to, to jail for 10 or 15 years in this case. And and so, but the court, after five days, now normally a criminal trespass case takes five minutes. So to Judge Conrad's credit, to allow five days of testimony, he knew that Larry Daigle represented thousands of fishermen who for decades and decades, whose fathers and grandfathers fished in those swamps, went out the you know, being being harassed by landowners or claimants, and they're fishing in the water. They're conducting commerce. Uh, you can't fish on land, and land is what you walk on. Uh, water is what you bring your boat on, and, and, and there's no way you can fish crawfish unless you are in navigable waters. Uh, I mean, the shallowest you can fish is about two feet, I think. Is that well, they, they, the, uh, those so-called landowners, water bottom claimants, they had never been challenged until that 
That's why we don't have that problem anymore. You know, every yeah. time we, we went to court with him after that, we beat him. Then the, the uh, judge, we that's right. We lost to Judge Como in the case where we wanted a state and the landowners to define their property lines, their boundaries, survey the high watermark. Well, the state uh, screwed us on that deal right there. Yeah, the state said they had no uh, issue. They knew where all yeah. the boundaries was, which was a, a lie, a legal lie. But well, we didn't really lose. All the judge said is we had to pick out a specific area and, and fight one battle at a time. You know? Yeah, and, and what happened, which nobody knows where the boundaries are, and then after the case was all over, you remember the, the landowner's attorney went back to court and asked for an order to prevent you guys from fishing on, quote, the landowner's private land. And the judge says, well, the state won't say where the boundaries are. The private landowners won't say the boundaries are. So the boundaries are unknown. And as such, you know, he sent a letter to all the DAs in the basin saying that the boundaries are unknown. And if you don't know where the boundaries are, you cannot arrest somebody for trespassing on your property because you don't know where your property lines are. And, and the, the doubt is always in the favor of the accused. And there was a legal doubt established by this case. And you know, they always claim they pay taxes on that property. Not you know, much. Will Williams Incorporated pays 59 cents an acre. If they could have a million dollar facility on an acre property, they pay 59 cents an acre. Uh, my brother-in-law pays $800 for uh, right next door to my house. He has about maybe three acres over there and it costs him $800 a year. They even sent me one this year for $10. First time I ever got a, a, a tax bill for my property. Really? And uh, say, uh, I know it. Uh, uh, Semart Land pays a dollar twenty nine. Uh, Generet pays about fifty or sixty. They claim they pay taxes on that property. Fifty sixty they, cents. They, they're not paying no taxes on that property. Uh, Exxon owns one hundred sixty nine thousand acres in Vermillion Parish, and they paid. In 017, $59,000 in taxes. There's one company that claims 29,000 acres in White Lake. They must have 200 oil wells in, in that area. And their taxes in 017 was $2,400 on 29,000 acres. That's barely 50 and, cents and an acre. Half, you think about this half of the revenue as far as property taxes goes to the schools. So who are you robbing? You're robbing the children of a good education. You're robbing the, the state of its future. Uh, look at Exxon, 169,000 acres paid $59,000 in taxes. Not enough to pay two teachers a year. Mm -hmm. I, and, and the state's broke. That, that's right. And you know, look at the battle that you guys, LCPA through your brother and all, and, and a lot of volunteers, tracked down this Section 16 issue. Section 16, you know, in 1787, when Congress decided how they're going to divide the real estate that's mostly owned by the federal government at the time, and they set up the townships and ranges and. You have 36 sections in a township, and every section almost right in the middle, 16, would be dedicated to educating the children of that township. Now, Louisiana has about 2,000 of them, and we have about 700 of them left. Um, Red River Parish, Caldwell Parish, all areas where uh, the the big Haynesville, you know, oil boom is. Uh, and, and Red River Parish own about 20,000 acres in that. They shouldn't have gold knobs on their school doors. Mm. And the schools are literally falling down. Mississippi, back uh, about 2000, saw this was going on and they were just like Louisiana, they lost all these Section 16 during Reconstruction, they went to federal court and took them all back. 
And the same thing was tried in St. Martin Parish. St. Martin Parish had been given 28,700 and something acres under the Section 16 program, and they only have 8,000 acres left. Yeah, they uh, had like 39 in St. Martin Parish. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And everyone that they stole, that's where the oil wells are. Well, of course, that's exactly right, you know. And, and did some horrible things to the school board. They had, in Henderson, on a section 16, they still own. Drill a big well in there, they're making 600 miles a day. And it's in the middle of this square mile. And our secretary of DNR figured out a way to help the landowners in the area. They made a five mile long triangle into where that well was, where the school board only got 3%, mm -hmm. and they should have been getting all the royalties. So uh, it's almost criminal what has gone on. You know, it's not just property rights they're taking. They're taking, you know, revenue it takes to educate our children, and, and the revenue our children have a right to. You know, that's that's the, the reason why they don't want to educate the children. The the law in 1847, the federal law said you could sell a 16, but it had to be sold in its entirety, and it only at an election where a majority of the registered voters in that township approved the sale. In Louisiana history, there were only two such elections, and both of them failed. So that means all these Section 60s that were sold were sold illegally, and the state has a right to claim them back. And you know, in the law they said, if a Section 16 is legally sold, the revenue has to go into the Treasury to be in the state Treasury, to be controlled, and to pay 6% per year. Well, you'd think out of, you know, 1500 section 16 there'd be a lot of money for the school boards out there there's not a dime in that so every school board across the state would have a right to go make a demand of the state to pay the six percent per year and when you compound it you know this is a multi-million dollar obligation that every school board that lost property is entitled to but who are you going to call <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, these owners are all very prominent people. Um, you know, they, uh, their kids went to law school and is in, their kids end up as the judges. And, you know, so it's hard to reverse these things. But Mississippi figured out. The state of Mississippi took all their Section 16s back. Their revenue went from $2 million a year on Section 16s to $90 million a year the first year they took it back. It's not hard to do. No, you just no. Have to they have put a, two or three cases in federal court and yeah, one of them all is that, hey, it's not you hard. want to fight it, guys, you go back to federal court and fight it. And there's a lot of innocent parties that are hung and caught in this thing, you know. But, you know, I looked at a, a map of, of, of Oils Parish, 1875 parish map, and that map shows every section 16 is still in the hands of the school boards. And you look at today's map, probably in a Falls Parish, half of those Section 16s are privately owned and claimed. And, and so who pays the price? The school children pay the price. Well, all these guys are bought and paid for. And say, the then, board you know, one of the cases that you all involved was Lake Rockade. Uh, and that was both in state court and federal court. Yeah. And and uh, Judge Watney had the case in state court ruled in the favor of the fishermen. Fishermen wanted to duck hunt, use it, and fish in it. And private landowners were claiming they were trespassing. And um, of course, the whole center of the lake was by La Rome, yeah. which had not been surveyed, which was a state-owned water bottom. And, and so if it went right through the middle of the lake, you could literally be anywhere in the lake and still be below the ordinary high water mark. 
So Watney ruled in the favor of the fishermen, involved in injunction, and then one of the guys got shot at by a camp owner around there. That ended up in federal court, and the federal judge ruled that the waters in question were maritime public waters. It could be used in commerce. And, and, and you know, one of the things that St. Martin Parish realized that, well, they had a bunch of oil wells in there. And the parish is entitled to 10% of the royalties. And so we went trooping down to Baton Rouge with, you know, I guess Fred Mills and Mike Yuval and the attorneys that handled the case and a bunch of other people and met with the attorney general. And um, he it was not, not there and turned us over to a law student um, who was not even an employee of the attorney general's office. He was there um, as a student. And, and so, you know, uh, even though these cases have been handled to this, handed over to the state, involving millions in oil and gas revenue royalties, uh, and the state refuses to act on these things. Uh, you know, it involves trespassing cases, and the crawfish are not worried about, you know, who gets the oil and all that. They want their rights to be on those lakes that are public. That's right. It, that never was our battle, you know. No, if the state don't want to go after their resources, that that never was my battle. No, it battle wasn't. Was but it just as a, as an incident, as a part of it, the state is handed a legal gift that you know all that to say. Well, this case ruled that this was public waters of the state, and oil on it belongs to the people of Louisiana. And what a shame! The state is asleep again. Sleep at the switch. Um, you know, we, we lost the Civil War and we're still paying for it. And you, you look at coastal restoration, uh, you all have been somewhat involved in that. You know, uh, we're spending mega millions uh, trying to rebuild Marsh. Um, it's uh, uh, the last hearing in Baton Rouge involved the approval of 2,100 acres of marsh restoration and uh, at a cost of $247 million. That's $130,000 an acre. And the big question is, will it work or not, you know? They could open by the fish? Yeah, right. That would build it back. Uh, o open, open all it up the river. Open all the bodies open and all the, the marsh and the marsh right. is going to come back. And, they, and, they don't want the and that's what the research has shown. They is, don't want. Yeah. They don't want. Uh, they don't want. In, they don't care. In Vermillion Parish, we're spending thirty-eight million dollars on uh, the coal buyer restoration site. I was there yesterday, and um, this is where we pumping mud into the marsh uh, from a hydraulic dredge, and um, they built levees in three different lakes, ponds, to pump this into. But the levees are not staying up. I mean, they can't even keep the levees up. So now they're pumping all this mud. It's gone all over creation. You know, the biggest mess. And then you they, can't go there. It's no, private. you can't go there. It's private. It's, it's posted. Uh, you got 11 new dams. Every bayou in there is being dammed. Uh, with new million dollar dams. It's like Catahoula Lake. They want to dredge the lake. The lake's been filled in with the Tash Vermillion pro the Tash Vermillion project. Well anyhow they dredge the lake, they would they need to dredge the lake. But as long as they're pumping that muddy water from the top of Catabla over there, that lake's gonna sand back up in a half an hour. You know, in high water, it's going to sand back In up. high water, it overflows those dams, and what should be oh, done... they pump it. They pump it in, into, uh, into the on this end. They, they take 18% of our water, whenever that water's hot, and pump it on this side, in Vermillion and the Tesh and... Uh, That's right. Yeah. And Catahoula. 18% of the water that comes through, they take it and uh, they pass it on this side, and it's full of uh, sediment. It's coming from the Chapalaya River, and of course, at times it is 
high level of settlement. Uh, it generally has worked pretty good uh, because it takes care of uh, poor water quality during very That's low That's why they water. did it, because yeah. of the pollution. As pollution the was dumping and, and, their sewage in the lake yeah. and in so the bayou. Be, yeah. The bayou was polluted, so they started passing that, that, that muddy water in there. The yeah. bayou wasn't polluted no more. Yeah. Now the bayou sanded up. Yeah. And you get a big salt wind like in, in Catahoula Lake. If you if you're pumping sediment from the top and you got a big salt wind, you don't have no current going down. So all the sediment's gonna fall back in the lake. We used to catch soccer leaves right off the bank, right in the back of my house. I can remember what it Now it's dry ground right now. No, nobody bought crawfish because you could go with a little twenty five foot minocene and walk along the edge of the levee, just make a circle and you'd have three or four sacks of crawfish. Yeah. Boy, well, those days gone. We have failed to manage it. I mean, we, we had a paradise there. Uh, we have a yeah. Yellowstone right there. Yes, we do. And uh, I don't understand why the politicians don't want to fix it. When the reality is, you know, you have all these dead zones, and, and look, the Cocoa Dree Swamp's one of them. I think Dr. Paul Kemp, he went and did some LIDAR research and, and computer modeling of that. And you have water at eight different levels. Um, nature yeah. doesn't put water at eight different levels. You got all kinds of ponds and impoundments and close this pipeline, block this water, block that water. And, you know, the whole thing is screwed up. And it could be restored on this one, one segment at a time. You know. In all these areas, it, would take, it wouldn't take a lot of work to fix it. And the Corps has an easement to do anything they want anywhere in that basin. Oh, yeah. So the thing yeah. about fighting the landowners about stuff like this, if you want to go out there and open a natural bayou, they I don't can care, show build the pipelines who, everywhere they want. Who's claiming that bayou? The Corps has an a, a easement out there. They've been yep. paid for those easements where they could do anything they want. But they don't want. You on the air? Can we help you? Yes, uh, it's my understanding that the Nature Conservancy uh, is uh, pl uh, planning a project to restore some of the, the uh, hydrology in the basin. And I may have missed, if you've already discussed it, I may have missed it, but could you comment on the status of that project? You know, this one of the, that's the only group, and they're working with the state to actually deal with this water quality problem. And uh, to be able to succeed on something like this, there must be a baseline study of what the water quality is presently, what the vegetation is, what the tree life, what the fisheries resources are. All those you need to have a baseline. What the benthos community, all the clams and snails and critters live in the bottom, you know, and it, they, they claim most of the basin has zero benthos life. Well, that should be scientifically documented. You can't just say that, you know. But this project is spending two years of baseline research. Yeah, I met with those people and they've been doing their homework. And I suggested a lot of stuff that what they needed to do and they agreed to it. They want to reopen some of the natural bodies off of body soil and bring the uh, the level down where the water passes at about five feet at Butte La Rose. And that's what you need to do. You know, what they want to do is what you need to do. What needs to be done, absolutely. And I ask them a lot of questions, because I ask a lot of questions when I meet with somebody. And uh, they had some good answers. You know, they, they've been doing their homework, and that area that they want to fix up, it's dead. It's a big corner of rotten, it's just a dead corner of rotten water. And one of those dead zones that we're talking about, and so you have a group with the scientific credentials, with the resources, the Nature Conservancy, and they've, they've partnered with the state and a lot of volunteers and, and, and college students, master's degree students who are approaching you know, their studies uh, at, at, with various disciplines, you know, some are crawfish, you know, fisheries people, some are dealing with the, uh, the trees and, and how poor water quality impacts uh, how trees grow, including the cypress in it. And, and so uh, this is an excellent 
you know, attempt to deal with this water quality issue, and and we support them highly. And and there's plenty of opposition to this. We don't we don't know exactly why, but uh, we hope they prevail and can go through with this project. And we'll know, you know, on a very sound scientific basis whether it is successful. And if it is successful, we duplicate it in other places. If it's not successful, we don't do that again. And and but a lot of this coast restoration projects and all, including the one in Vermilion Bay, there's no fisheries research, there's no botanical research, there's no sediment research. Uh, there's very little research about the material they're taking from the bay out of an old oil field that could be full of old cuttings and you know uh, uh, the 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 uh, the material that comes from produced waters, which is a hard list of toxins that you're trying to make marsh with. So our hats are often an nature conservancy for uh, doing a real good job, and hopefully they succeed. But they'll I, be I, able to tell us scientifically whether they I they're fished not. over there already, right below that. That's right above Lake Murphy. And uh, Lake Murphy used to be a, a big, deep lake, and it got cut off by... Uh, the a couple of pipelines and the intercoastal, and they want to go out there and make cuts in those in those spall banks, and they want to open up some water coming in from the top of Barry Saul, and if they do what they said they want to do, well, to me it's going to be a good project. Yeah, but you never know okay, great. what the cause is. All right, thank them. you so much for the call. We appreciate it. So it's real important, you know. That's a real important issue because. So far, you know, when the basin program got cranked up and the Sierra Club was very involved in making that happen, they did a lot of ridiculous projects. I mean, we built the golf course, we built, uh, what else, uh, opera house. They spent a million dollars at Butler Rose at the landing and all they did was blacktop the landing and put some lines over there, 700 something thousand. They, 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 they bought a car dealership in Opelousas? They yeah. bought a, a, a didn't they buy the uh, they bought a, a, a that old buying. industrial site in downtown St. Martin? Yeah, St. Martinville, about J.B. Talley. J.B. Talley site, which is now a park. That they tried to make it was, into a... Uh, that was condemned right there. They couldn't even do nothing with that. Yeah, I mean, it was an industrial waste, you know, the industrial site. And they had all kinds they put of us some signs at the landing, like nobody knows where the landing's at. They put some signs on the river. They, and, and about the best, they they about had, the they best thing moved, they did was they, the tourist center, is that correct? They never moved a spoon of dirt to improve water quality anywhere else in that basin. No. They, they, Mr. Howard, I, I've been fighting this for like 20 years, and y'all are like the mafia. I try to get out, and y'all just want to pull me back in. <laughs> I was out of that. Now I'm involved in that again. Well, it's an important fight because, uh, you know, as you said, this area can recover. When you manage the water right, when you restore those, you know, historical flows, um, then the response is overnight. You grow a frog crop right away, you grow a crawfish crop right away. E even the, a lot of these places, you can't even get into them. Even if they did have fish or crawfish in them, you can't get into it. Most of these, these uh, dead man's bayou is one of them. It's beautiful bayou over there, off the Phillips. You know, you couldn't get a boat in there if your life depended on you. You'd need a crane. Most of these areas could could be fixed with small equipment too, where you wouldn't even have to knock down a tree. Yeah, you know, right. those bayous I mean, are there. Those dead bayous man's, are there. Yeah, they there. Dead, dead man's bayou could run a tugboat and barges through it. You know, but it's got a dam with thirty foot levees. I mean, it's as high as the Chaplain Levee itself. Oh, yeah. You can't get flood water. We have the highest flood you want. It still wouldn't get into that. And that was all a lake at one time. That yeah. was all yeah. Chico. Right all lake, yeah, Chico Pass, Chico, Lake Chico. So, Mike, thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge and your history in the basin. Hope you have a great crawfish year. We got a lot of water coming to us. Uh, it's. Uh, you may be putting your boat in the water, you know, at the top of the landing. I uh, just go whenever uh, I, I I can't hardly fish no more. I'm all crippled up, but 
I go in and get something to eat, you know. Yeah. My, wife, my wife likes bald grilled fish. And then yeah. I bring you a sack. That's right. I, I get a sack every night. Right. I bring right. All, everybody yeah. a sack. So thanks a lot for being on the program tonight, Mike. You've shared a lot of the history that's important to us all because the rights that you all have established to use the waters of the basin it has it's enjoyed by everyone. The, the guy out there brim fishing, the guy out there wants to take pictures, somebody canoeing or kayaking, all those people want to enjoy that basin. And it is our Yellowstone. Uh, and this is equal to the Yellowstone as a magnificent jewel in the South. And uh, it's usable all year long. And it changes, one of the dramatic things about it is how much it changes from high water to low water, how that whole system changes. Years ago, we had, you'd have 500 trucks at every landing, you know, yep. during, during the Yeah, you'd have 100, season. right. Yep. So yep. Mike, thanks a lot for being here tonight. Uh, we sure appreciate sharing uh, 